going to come back and moderate his panel. Brian, Barbara, come on up here. And he's going to introduce us, get his panel kicked off. Thanks for your patience. It's a real pleasure as someone that grew up on so many of these award-winning artist projects. We're about to see a sizzle reel for these Tony, Grammy, and Oscar-winning entertainers. You're about to see. Let's roll the footage. Stranger Things is not, not on the project list. I'm going to assume that means that was a wrong loading. So why don't I just give you guys a lead in. Uh, first, the award winning stage actor, multi Emmy nominated star of four DC projects from Batman and Robin, rating aside, he had a lot of fun. Uh, Smallville Lionel Luther. or the Carpenters, Elvis, Three Dog Night, Daft Punk. You can see him as the villainous swan, the villainous penguin, or the guy that's just going to put 500 on the bandit. Ladies and gentlemen, Oscar and Grammy winner Paul Williams.
team ups with Richard Mull and Mark Hamill. Yeah, exactly. But you know, the, I think the thing that's most important, the entire thing, is that the people, a lot of people, don't know and or forget uh, that when we do this for a living, it doesn't mean we have to give up our fan card. And I never gave up my fan card. I walked onto the, you know, to the end of the sessions to record, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, and looking at the talent around me, and I get excited about that. I'd show up for Hollywood Squares, you know, Peter Marshall just died, oh God, love it. You'd go to do, you'd go to do uh, uh, Hollywood Squares, and the first thing I would do is run in and look at the, the squares, look at the set, and read the names, and go, who, uh, who is gonna be up there that I've never, never met before, and he'd walk in and he'd go, Vincent Price, holy God, oh my God, I love Vincent Price, or, you know, or Rick is right down the list, anybody from Burt Reynolds to, to whoever was there, I think part of the, the joy in this deal, and we have, you know, I mean, we, we also do a bunch of these, I just started doing it this year, and all, and incidentally, if you're coming to see me, all the money, everything that I raise goes to recovery and our arts education, I'm 34 years sober, and it's, uh, Four years ago, there's a lot of maybeville. Somebody said, "Hey, have you ever performed in Tampa?" And I go, "Maybe, <laughs> maybe." You know, you know. But throughout the, the years, and, and you know, I started started at first as an actor in my early 20s, and couldn't make really make a living at it, and started you know knowing my life is a gift. When I don't get something that I think I really, really want, I get something that I really really need, and and and, and, and something that I really love doing. So. For all these years, the, the best part of this deal for me is I get to hear the stories. And when somebody comes up and says, my mom was a single mom and you and me against the world was an important song for us. Or somebody says, my little girl has learned to play Rainbow Connection on the piano. That's a heart payment for me. And I really love being here. And I appreciate your advocacy through the years. It's, it's made for a great life. Thank you. As you talk about those intersections of actors that you admire and the opportunities to work together, it, it's funny because uh, Roddy McDowell and John were very good friends for years, and you knew Roddy from War of the Planet of the Apes, and he was one of the most impressive uh, Mad Hatter incarnations in the Batman universe brought from Alice in Wonderland, but he delivered such a great performance. But as John said, you're not going to show up at dinner and say, I just recorded this great Batman cartoon. But if it had ever come up, you would all three have known, like, oh, wow, we all are involved in this thing. Which brings me to this sort of amazing journey you had with Kevin Conroy from the Shakespeare at the Globe, from... When he got out of school, he came down to the Globe, and we did a season of Shakespeare. I mean, it was his first professional job. So I'd known Kevin for years and years. Uh, before he came and, and I walked in and, and saw what he could do with that voice of his. It was just breathtaking. He's a, one of the sweetest men in the world. Guy died much too soon. She should be around still forever. But he will be. <laughs> he will always be remembered as the Batman. 30 years doing the voice. Exactly. It is impressive when you, you saw him on stage and then when, when he went to that place with the character. Yep. It was it was stunning. Uh, Paul, what do you remember about working with Kevin and then Andrea's direction? Because she was the one that found him after 500, over 500 people read for Batman yeah. before he got... Oh, yeah? I had no idea. You know, first of all, Andrea was amazing. And I'm somebody that, that absolutely, I love, you know, a lot of actors don't give me a line reading. I am... In fact, a professional actor, and I speak from my heart. When I speak, I speak from my heart, and oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with the Oh, hi, John. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when I was somebody like, you know, what are you, well, to, to, tell me what's going on here, because a lot of times, you know, you're looking at the script right at, at, as you're getting ready to record, uh, things have changed and whatever. I loved being told what to do. I still love being told what to do. It takes all the mystery out of it, and I have less chances of hurting myself. It's like, do it like this, and I would, and especially if you like, you, what's going on? You've just fallen off a building. You know, what do you sound like? And she would throw out a bunch of stuff. Uh, I knew Burgess Meredith. I was friends with Buzz. Wow. And, uh, 
So when you talk about, about the penguin for me to walk in and start doing the voice, of course I've got in my head, I've got that meow, 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 you know, the, 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 the buzz sounds, which were iconic and it's so solid. But then I read the scripts. And the scripts that we were given had, there was a depth and, a, and a, you know, there was, there was a sadness about Cobblepot. And, and uh, I found myself, you know, just finding a lot of, you know, you kind of match up things in your own past that match in a moment with a character and you find something that begins to really speak to you uh, in, in a very real way. And I think about this character in his childhood and, and what he looks like and how much smaller he is than the rest of the world. And all of a sudden you fly in rodent and there, you begin to get the, the pain behind, behind the anger. You know, I think there's a direct line between the wound and the weapon. It's like that 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 evil that, that would rise out of him was born in a, in, the, in the horror of his childhood pain, and, and that was the gift of, of playing this role, finding a story that you know that that in a sense when you when you really begin to look at those elements in a character and what you're doing, and many times there's, for, I think for us as actors, certainly for me, certainly for somebody that came from a kind of a broken background, I find healing. I think, I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, the people come up and talk to us about Batman. I think there's, there's the adventure and there's the entertainment and the loving of the characters, especially Batman. But I think there's a connection to the darkness of it and the brokenness in it. And I find that the Batman, Batman fans sometimes are incredibly, they're very feeling, they're, they're very open emotionally. And I love that. I love, I love finding that in, uh, in anybody. Well, that's so wise because there was uh, an amazing episode with uh, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy where they team up and she basically breaks up with the Joker but she wants to go back. And it was the first time in any cartoon they depicted a toxic relationship with an abusive male in that series. And uh, with the episode Birds of the Feather, I'm giving you guys homework on all these name drops. But with Birds of a Feather, the penguin's released from jail and he, and he comes home and expects to see Two-Face or, or Joker, but Batman's there and he, uh, he says, I'm going to keep an eye on you, and Penguin tries to go straight and make aristocratic friends, and he finds out that he's the butt of the joke, and the pain all comes back. And, and it, they did show that fractured nature, and Riddler's Reform, the third episode John got to record, uh, the Riddler goes straight, and he's getting toy licensing for all his creativity, but part of him just can't stop being a criminal. He's addicted to trying to beat Batman, and it, it, all, it was such a complex writing staff that really showed, like you say, it's the adventure and fun, but these characters had these flaws and, and these beautiful things you could exploit in the narrative. So, how about a round of applause for everybody on that staff. Now, another overlap uh, with these two gentlemen, which was included in this very long title for the panel, uh, was uh, from uh, Gremlins to Muppets to Batman. Uh, John, you were choked and then you shredded a gremlin. I know. I had to look all over. Yeah, it's great though. Can you talk about the puppeteers with the microphone and kind of how you guys worked? Uh, well, you know, during rehearsal and everything, they, I mean, it took, I mean, about ten, it seems, uh, people to, to, to do the stuff with the eyes and the noses and the stuff and so we play around in rehearsal and everything and then we'd shoot a bit and then um, and then they die they all went like like that all the puppets and I it was the people had to take a break the, the puppeteers but I thought oh my god they're all dead now and because they were exhausted by the time they were playing with me for rehearsal so but but it was uh, it was amazing to, to watch them. Uh, work those uh, all those things together. I mean, they were so talented. Those people, amazing. But you've also worked with CGI and having, and you know, Shazam, the Googles and the Goblins. It's much better, I think. And I think cinema goers. That's why they like what Tom Cruise is doing. I think people really want to see real practical effects, practical puppeteering. I think 
audiences are leaning back into that because it's more of an artistry. And I think that's something that those movies hold up with is because you have puppeteers actually controlling that and the, the human element is what we love in cinema, I think. Yeah. And Paul, you've worked with so many Muppets. I did, you know, it's for me, it's family. I have, you know, felt in my DNA. It's just, I, I, I went in over to do the, the first season of The Muppets and I met Jim Hansen. And it, the, the way that it felt, it felt, you know, I was never a kid that belonged to a gang that had a tree house. I always wanted to belong to a gang that had a tree house. I met Jim Henson and the Muppeteers, and I had a gang that had a tree house. It felt like the best sandbox I ever played in in my life. I walked on the set, and, and if, 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 if Dave Colts is there holding Gonzo, and Frank Oz is there holding Piggy, there are, there are one, two, three, there are five of us in the conversation. And Gonzo is as sweet and as loving and as tender and kind as any creature I've ever met in my life. Piggy says things to me that I could not repeat on this stage. <laughs> just, and it's just hilarious. And, and I had been a fan of the Muppets long before I knew they were Muppets. I mean, I'm talking about Jim back to the, the Ed Sullivan show and Slinkies and Manamana and all. But, but uh, for some reason we really connected and he told me he was going to do a one-hour thing for, for HBO called Emma Daughter's Jumpman Christmas. And, uh, and, uh, and he gave me the script and he said, I'd love for you to, th to think about writing the songs for this. And I, I loved the story. It was, it was a beautiful story. Uh, I, I was, you know, ran off and did it with my own band and, and uh, you know, I wrote the songs <coughs> and recorded them. And, and uh, I think it was my audition for the Muppet movie. Uh, I, I just, I always thought that Joe Raposa was going to wind up writing the songs for, uh, for the Muppet movie. And I'm not sure why he wasn't asked to because I thought it was brilliant. He wrote, it's not easy being green. But when I was asked to write the songs for the Muppet movie, although I'd written Emma Daughter alone, I said, I want to bring in my, I'd just written most of the songs for A Star is Born with Streisand with a guy named Kenny Asher. I wrote Evergreen with Barbara, but most of the songs I wrote with Kenny Asher. Wonderful composer and a big sentimentalist just like me. And, and I talked to Jim and I said, can I bring Kenny in to, to work on music with me? And he said, yeah. And it was just, it was the absolute right combination. And, and writing, writing the songs for, for that movie and then later on after Jim passed, The Muppet Christmas Carol and, and Letters to Sam and a couple other things. It's been a lifelong relationship, and it's just been the best. And I think that the reason that the Rainbow Connection is alive today is because I think there's probably the spirit of, of Jim Henson in that song as much as anything I've ever written. And uh, an absolute honor to have anything to do with all of those people. They're wonderful. There's some, isn't he amazing? I've been so lucky to know him now. I want to touch on two fantastic villainous performances. Uh, John, I want to first start with you. We just got to see on your Instagram, we found the video of Ebert and Roper bragging about you as an up-and-coming actor that steals the show from Roy Scheider in 52 Pickup, which meant a lot to you. You know, your dad, you told him at Towson State Teachers College, Dad, I'm going to go act. And then to have that moment when you tell him about this big film, and he goes, I've read that book. That's got to be. Elmore Leonard, he said. Elmore Leonard. Yeah. I had no idea it was a book. So I went and got and read it about 20 times. And I just had a ball being that nasty man. I, I used my Baltimore accent for it. So he sounded stupid, but he was so clever. So fucking clever. <laughs> Five years old in the audience are there. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but also, like, you would create scenes. You killed John Travolta's wife, Kelly Preston, and that scene wasn't working, so you and uh, Frank... Frankenheimer. Yeah, John Frankenheimer. He directed it. Yeah, we sat in our my little, little thing, and I said, this doesn't make any sense. And so the two of us just sat and, and sort of talked it through, and then we went out and shot it. And my mind then was young, so I could remember it all. And we, and we just had a blast. It was, it was the two of us just fixed it.
It was very, it was very creepy, and there was tension building as you're running the camcorder, and then she gets shot. It was incredibly dark. Well done, yeah. So I, I think I'll watch that movie again. Uh, I don't know. I was pretty good at it, wasn't I? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I have touched every part of Anne Margaret there is to touch, almost. <laughs> she was a doll. She came up to me, for, 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 we had a reading of it, and after the reading she said, John, you know, I'm not a trained actor, and I don't really know how, so could you just stay in character all the time whenever I'm around? And I thought, oh crap, I wanted to get friends with Anne Margaret, but now i got to be some baddie. So, so I, there was a scene where I shot her full of uh, something and put her in the trunk of my car and drove her off. And, uh, uh, and uh, she said, she walked into the, in the room where I was waiting for her to do a scene and she said, have you shot anything yet? And I said, I don't take drugs, lady. I just give drugs. She said, no. I said, have you shot any scenes yet, John? <laughs> so I just made a fool of myself. Yeah. <laughs> right in front of Anne Margaret. Paul, when you're when you're coming up with Swan and you're acting with you know these the incredible costumes and the helmets and this sort of you know you see a film like The Phantom of the Paradise, you see a film like Star Wars, they're so bold and every actor that's ever worked on something like that, they're just like we are really on a on a road, we're going at a high speed and we don't know where this thing's going to land. What's it like in that sort of a Creative. Well, it was interesting because Brian De Palma came over to AM Records where I was a contract writer, and, and at the time in 1974 is when it came out, so probably 1973, uh, I was, from about 1970 on, I was known as a writer. I mean, I started writing in like 1967, and for about three years I wrote a lot of album cuts, a lot of B sides, never heard anything of mine on the radio. I was like, am I ever going to be anything on the radio. In the meantime, I'm making a really good living writing songs for everybody, essentially. And, and uh, But then I started to go on a nice run with the Carpenters. We've only just begun rainy days and Mondays. I won't last today without you. Let me be the one. The Three Dog Night, Old Fashioned Love Song, uh, Out in the Country, uh, Family of Man. And, and none of, when you look at that, none of that really sounds like anything which should make me qualified to write songs for Fan of the Paradise. I think I was probably a really bad choice based on what I'd written before. But I'm an, I'm, I'm, I'm an out-of-work actor, and so when Brian De Palma hired me to write the songs, I approached them at, at, for the characters like an actor. You know, what is, you know, what is this song? The other thing is it was, it was a chance to satirize all these different kinds of music that I loved. But it wasn't famous for me. From like do up for you know, for you know goodbye Eddie goodbye for you, for you know the uh, the, the uh, God, what was the name of the group? You know, I happen to see Juicy Fruits. Thank you exactly. <laughs> uh, I have a great memory. I'd like you to meet her. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, 